Now, there is now a pause. So here's Gaylor's diffusion pump here. Uh, but the pause is while Europe beats itself up and tries to destroy itself in two world wars. Um, and you can see that the action starts again uh, after the Second World War, uh, when, again, there is a drive to higher vacuums. And this comes from the um, nuclear work being done in the USA and uh, Russia and, uh, and the UK, France and China, uh, but also uh, civilian nuclear power as well. Uh, and it also comes from international scientific collaborations that start, uh, things like CERN uh, that we know about today. Uh, and these drove us to higher vacuums. This was one of the first devices to be created after the war. It's called a turbo-molecular pump, a turbo, as, as scientists call it. And, and if, if the last pump I showed you was about atomic billiards, this one is about cricket. Essentially, these, these veins here, these, uh, these blades, rotate so quickly, they literally smash the molecules into a backing pump, uh, similar to the one you saw before. So this is real, you know, sort of, this is real bully boy stuff, getting rid of your gas. So all the pumps I've talked about so far um, are about removing gas from a vacuum chamber. But in the 1970s, a new idea emerged. What you can't get rid of, just stick to the side of the chamber. Um, an Italian chap called Cristoforo Benvenuti was at the centre of all this. He worked at CERN and developed a sticky film, uh, which he called a getter. Uh, it's like flypaper for lonely gas particles. And, and this is a, a picture of the LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider, which is the forerunner to the Large Hadron Collider. It, it lives in the same tube, but it was a different, uh, a different device in, in the middle. And, and that had 22 kilometres of getter in it to try and uh, get an even higher vacuum in the beam line uh, than existed. Um, now, that's not the best of these pumps. Benvenuti also pioneered a, a method used in, in the LHC, so same tunnel, tunnel different, uh, different tube in the middle. Uh, this is the LHC. And he, uh, Benvenuti came up with the idea of cryopumping, in which you freeze any stray particles to the walls of the chamber. And this helps the LHC beam line down to about 10 to the minus 12 tor. That's 100 million millionths of an atmosphere, 10 to the minus 14 atmospheres which is colossal, but we're not quite finished yet. The last note at the bottom here is called Alpha. Now, Alpha um, is an experiment at CERN uh, which is used to confine antimatter. When antimatter comes into contact with matter, they annihilate one, one another. Um, now, the fact that CERN scientists can now keep antimatter in a vacuum for a long period of time seems to suggest that we're actually getting very, very close to the perfect vacuum. It's not 10 to the minus 6, of course, it, at 16 it should be zero uh, tor, but, but it may be that we're near as damn it there. Um, now, you might think, end of the graph, that's the end of the story, uh, but actually, I have one last point to make. The vacuum I've talked about so far is. What, what would be termed a, a classical vacuum. That's a, a box with nothing inside it. But in the past 80 years, as you heard from Marcus, quantum physics has told us that even the emptiest of empty spaces is seething with energy, with electromagnetic fluctuations. And in quantum physics, electromagnetic fluctuations are synonymous with particles. So the dominant view today is that even the highest vacuums will still be filled with virtual particles popping into and out of existence. There are problems with that particular um, uh, viewpoint, as Marcus pointed out, but that is still the dominant view. So, hence, I've, re I've brought back Aristotle. His reasoning was way off, but perhaps he was right all along. Nowhere in the universe is there a truly empty space. Thank you.